evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Matteson. My guest tonight has been prominent in Cape Town and Eastern Cape academia for half a century, Professor Francis Wilson. An economist, he taught for 30 years at the University of Cape Town. He was recently awarded an honorary doctorate. But we're not going to spend too much time on your CV, Francis, because we want to cover important current ground. At the end of this program, when I recommend a book, I will talk to you a little bit about your mother, Professor Monica Wilson. Uh, one of the leading anthropologists in the country because her book, has a book about her has just come out. It's called The Fires Beneath the Light. Monica Win Wilson, South African anthropologist by um, Sean Murrow. But we'll come to that later. For now, I want to get straight to some key areas of your special expertise. I remember as a student in the 1970s, it was you who made students like me think about the fact that your research disclosed that black mine workers' wages, if you account for inflation, had not gone up at all from 1911 to 1969. That was in your book of that time, Labor in the South African Gold Mines. After that, of course, Cyril Ramaphosa's National Union of Mine Workers began to organize in the mines uh, the first effective trade unions for blacks, and, uh, and, and wages did start to, to, uh, to rise. Um, and your later research was pioneering on poverty, and you still work on that, the Carnegie work, which is so important. But I want to start with mining. You studied the evils of migrant labor. What did you expect should be done once a democratic government was in power here? Well, maybe I'm being, it's easy to be wise after the event, but I must say that I would have expected that uh, immediately there would be a, a requirement from government that the mining industry must begin to move immediately towards stabilizing labor, by which I mean building family houses for workers who wanted to be with their families as miners. And, you know, I would have expected or hoped that government would call in the mining captains and say to them, gentlemen, you've had a hundred and something years of free ride on bringing in labor just when you needed it, using it single as, sex hostels. Single sex hostels, uh, 10,000 men in a hostel, that kind of thing. And treating it rather like electricity, where you bring it in when you need it and send it back when you don't. And you could have said, well, 1% per year, you'll build houses for 1% of your workers per year. It wouldn't have needed all the workers because some would still have chosen to stay in Ponderland or wherever they were to come in as migrants. But I would have imagined about half maybe would have said, yes, we'll, we'll take it. Well, that means in 10 years you would have done what you needed. Uh, and what Marikana showed, I think, was that we still had a migrant labor mentality in the mining industry. The one, the one area that did change, which was way back in the 1970s, was diamond mines, where they moved to a stable labor force in the 1970s, interestingly enough. But gold never did that, and platinum never did that, and so on. Was it financially feasible for the, for the mines to do it? Well, over time, yes. I mean, you know, you have to take these things slowly, um, but uh, if you're looking at the total wage bill, I mean, the white workers managed to gain uh, a significant share of, of the wage bill for themselves by their whole political processes in the previous 50 years or so. And you could have m normalized that. And you could have normal. Yeah, they were, uh, of course. I mean, it's, nothing can be done overnight. One is not looking for stuff, but it's a question of the direction in which you're growing. And maybe you would have said 1% a year is too much. We'll do half a percent a year, but at least you begin to move. Now, when that happened, uh, people who came in and were in charge of the economy, Tabo and Beke, who spent a lifetime outside South Africa, and um, Alec Irwin and others who'd worked in cert certain specialized aspects of labor and so on, did they consult people like you? Did they look for experts? You know, I can't speak for other people I don't know. Um, I was never asked about mining although uh, Card Asmol did bring me into a water council. Uh, so I How do you explain that? I mean, it's, 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 it, your ego is not at stake at this stage. Uh, um, you've done so many other things. But were there other experts like you that they did consult, or did they really not consult experts? You know, I don't really know, uh, John, about that. I'm, I, I think one got a lot of people coming in. I can remember getting a lecture from some guy from the IMF once, uh, in about 1990, goodness me, three, two, I can't remember when it was, maybe it was four already, 
who uh, gave us a lecture about the IMF and its anti-poverty policy, which I was interested in. And I remember saying to him, you know, uh, I think we're going to need to do something like uh, Roosevelt did in the Great Depression. We're going to have to have um, public works programs and so on and so forth. And he more or less patted me on the head and said, Sonny, you know, we're past that kind of thing now. We yes. don't do that. That's not, that's not in yeah. fashion and, anymore. And in so fashion. I did get a sense that there was more listening to some international experts than there was to local people. Yes. I must say, I, was, I had spent a year at the University of Chicago, so I knew the Chicago boys and the, those kind of economists. And I actually traveled with them to the, the former Soviet Union and saw what they were advising then. And most of it was, it was catastrophic. It really yeah. wasn't the right sort of thing. And yet it was a fashion of the time. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing about economics is that economists so often think that the understanding they have is universal. Yeah. Whereas it so much depends on the political, historical circumstances in which you're operating your analysis. And uh, my view was that the, uh, I wasn't at all clear in my mind that the overseas experts necessarily understood more than the South Africans did. Absolutely. Um, before we go to the break, I want to just focus on Marikana for a minute. What are the lessons we should have learned and have we learned them? Well, I think number one is consultation and listening. I mean, if you take the rock drill operators who are, in a way, the airline pilots of mining, uh, you know, without a rock drill operator, your mine doesn't function, just like an airplane doesn't fly without a pilot. Um, it seems to me extraordinary that the mining industry, the, the, both the uh, unions and the, the uh, uh, owners and, or the managers of the mines, allowed that ever to get to that state because one knew from the analysis of mine conflict in the 1970s how incredibly dangerous if you start messing around with the gaps within workers, uh, the sort of ratio of wages. And if you're suddenly pushing up wages of some people and the doctoral operators feel left behind, they are certainly going to complain. Uh, and, you know, that was, that's kind of ABC. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to finish on mining and we're going to talk about another area you've been looking into recently, and that's energy. We'll, we'll take a break. We're back talking to Professor Francis Wilson. Um, before we leave mining, I wanted to ask you one thing that seemed obvious when we looked at Marikana and, and looked at the conditions around that area. It seems, of course, Cyril Ramaphosa was a major shareholder and director of the company that was involved, uh, that was there. And um, it seemed to me that there was an attempt to change housing policy. And I think they started to say that we'll give you a choice that you can either live on the mine or you can take your money. Um, to, to live elsewhere in better conditions. But the consequence didn't work out that way. What they did was people took the money, uh, sent it home, and lived in slum conditions. Um, it also seems to me that the mine owners weren't looking at that. They weren't seeing what was actually going on on the ground, and that an untenable situation had perhaps inadvertently been created. Yeah, I think that's fair comment. I mean, I went up to Marikana the following week just to have a look-see. Uh, and I, you know, I didn't actually get inside any of the hostels, but I could see some of the appalling uh, shack conditions at the gates of, of the mine and so on. And I think that that is exactly correct, that there was a sense that, again, you could just change the thing overnight. You say to the miners, well, if you don't want to live in a hostel, here's the money instead. Um, and not look through the consequences. And not, not take through the consequences and not work out, well, how are we going to move from a migra an oscillating migrant economy to one in which you have people urbanizing with their households? In fact, what seems to have happened, if, uh, although I haven't done that analysis, but it seems to be that um, for a number of, of, of miners, well, you had your family back home and, and children and so on to whom you had to go on sending money, and maybe you got... Uh, had a second family uh, near the mine and right. you were going to live outside the hostel because that was actually nicer than living in the hostel but then you needed somebody to help look after your home and you needed more money. So and, you, and you also needed the local council to give reticulation and all of that sort all of thing. All of that. And a lot of that was not done. No, I think it did. I think the whole thing was in 
totally inadequate in terms of planning a transition and helping people to make that transition. It was kind of, you know, here's some money, you go look after yourself. We have to move on, and I want to talk about another area you've been, you've been researching, and that's energy. Yes. Uh, of course, we landed up with a situation where ESCOM was unable to provide uh, electricity, and President Mbeki, uh, in fairness to him, has actually admitted that some of the blame was his for, for, for making bad decisions. When he was advised to build extra power plants, he said no. Uh, and that proved to be a, a, a costly mistake. Um, but what's your solution now? What should we be doing? The president, of course, is flying to Moscow and talking about nuclear power. Well, I think we're on the beginning of an energy revolution which is going to be as dramatic as the digital revolution 25 years ago. And I think South Africa really needs to have its eyes wide open as to what the possibilities now are. And I was hearing um, somebody from the CSIR this last week at an uh, action dialogue we had under the Mandela Initiative where we're looking at ways of overcoming poverty and inequality. And what is clear now is that the price of solar energy has fallen, fallen by 80% in the last eight years, number one. 80%? 80%, at zero. So it's cheaper now than coal power, powered I'll electricity? I'll come to that in one second. Secondly, that the CSIR has done a very careful analysis sort of on five kilometer by five kilometer blocks all over South Africa, 30,000 of them, I think, uh, measuring winds, checking the solar, and by and large, throughout the country, we have got the solar power we need through the year, the wind power we need through the year, in order to produce all the energy we need and more, and solar and wind are both, are both cheaper than coal and nuclear doesn't get a look in. So uh, for us to go nuclear now or even to expand coal now, in my view, is crazy. What it also means is that energy can now be produced by uh, people living in houses in the Transkei, let's say, put it onto the Eskom grid. Eskom then has to buy this energy as other, like in California, for example, you can put your, your So energy. they actually get income. And you can, for the first time in a hundred years, the Transkei has got something to export other than labor. Uh, and so we just changed the whole system around that production of energy is decentralized. We still need Eskom because they've got to maintain their grid, sure. but we don't need their coal mines and we certainly don't need their nuclear power plants. So what's government doing? I mean, this is a solution. I've, I've also been looking into it and I know <coughs> from a young engineer I talked to that there have been breakthroughs not only in price, but also in storage capacity of solar energy mm -hmm. and even in something called base load, where, you, where when solar is not yeah. good in some parts, it's good in others. So all these solutions have made it cheaper than coal and created a social solution like the one you've described for a place like Transkei. Yeah. Is it being done? Well, it's mixed. I mean, uh, on the one hand, there has been a very good program a process over the last five years or so where government, I can't think quite how it works, but government guarantees and private sector puts them in. But we've had a huge expansion of wind power. Yes. Been very effectively done. Government has been very much part of that process. Yes. Two, the research from what I can check out has been extraordinarily good. Very good research by the CSIR and other people. Three, as you see if you drive around through the Karoo now, you'll see these uh, solar uh, panels for heating water. Mm -hmm. So, and that is government supported. Right. So there's a lot of renewable stuff going on. But I think government has still not quite sorted out their own thinking about coal, uh, nor about nuclear. The idea that nuclear should be on the, on the table anymore, in my view, is mad. It's, it's, it, so why, why is it on the table? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I think that we really have to start pushing very hard and saying why are we going to spend X million rand on working out whether we it's, need nuclear. Right. The, just the cost of looking at it yes. is, 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 is hundreds of millions. Well, isn't it 200 million? 200 rand million, just to look just, at it. Just to look at it this year. Uh, and I and think they, they should go and talk to the CSIR guys and ask them what they think. And of course, uh, it, nuclear came up after President Zuma went to Moscow. And yeah. of course, uh, President Putin is very engaged in trying to build, to, to sell nuclear plants around the world. It's one of the big things the, the Russians yeah. can sell. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just an academic. I'm not a politician in all of this. But I think that my suggestion is that government should really go and talk to their own 
uh, researchers at the CSR on St. Edmunds, and what do you guys think? So, so the research is all there from South Africans. We uh, just have to listen to it. My understanding is that I heard a brilliant paper from the CSR last week. Yeah. I must say, uh, the Department of Energy uh, has done some good things, not only with yeah. wind, but also with solar. There are yeah. plants being built. Yeah. But it seems yes, to be yes, the policy is just conf confused between solar at the same time as nuclear when the two don't... Well, I, I, I just think we need some clear analysis, very public, open, and some clear decision-making as to where we're going. At the moment, we seem to be trying all kinds of things simultaneously. And that's a good time to break. When we come back, we'll talk about the information economy. And we're back with Professor Francis Wilson. Um, Francis, you and I have both been interested in the information economy. What is your, and you advise governments uh, on these things, other governments, what, I mean, it seems to me, inf the information, eco information is the oil of the modern economy. Mm -hmm. If you do that right, you create thousands of good jobs above ground, better than mining, and so on. Um, what are you advising governments to do? Well, yeah, I mean, the, it, it's changing so fast, the information. I mean, I can remember being in Oxford in 1980 or something, and guys were more or less putting their typewriters, attaching them to television sets, and you just think how it's changed since then. Uh, with the speed and the capacity and everything, my view, as I was explaining to the government of Botswana years ago, is that if you're in a long way from markets, what you're going to look for is goods that you can export where transport costs are minimal. So a country like Botswana needs to have call centers, and so does Cape Town, and so does Johannesburg. That, and in the Eastern Cape, I was arguing years ago now that we should be training people to run call centers uh, and to, um, to staff them, as it were. Because I think there's a kind of infinite, unsatiable need for information and for managing this kind of thing, which the Indians have been doing very successfully. And South Africa should be in the same position because this country speaks good English right across the board. Uh, and so one has a global market in that way. So that I think that the possibility of using the information um, revolution for export is good. The second thing that seems to me important is um, for education and training. And there are wonderful things happening now with cell phones uh, and so on, uh, enabling people to train midwives, train nurses, youngsters can, you know, um, um, phone up for help and so, and so on, so that a much more systematic look at the new capacity that, cell, that the information revolution is giving us, in the same way the railways transformed the country, so the information revolution is yeah, transforming it, South Africa. And it applies to banking as well. Now, Absolutely. Now, I mean, in some respects, we've been ahead of the game on cell phones. We've done quite well. Our yeah. private sector, which is actually the two big cell phone companies, started before 1994. But they have uh, moved further and faster than anyone, including they, they themselves, thought we ever could. But, but really what, what held us up was big mistakes that were made from the 90s, uh, uh, and particularly in the Mbeki era, when, when uh, um, there was political interference in the process of opening up telecommunications. Right. And the consequence of that, of course, was that our, our, we, our rankings, our internet rankings in South Africa are now lower than at least five African countries whose economies are far less sophisticated. Yeah, well, that's, that's very uh, short-sighted, very, very short-sighted, because this is the growth, uh, this is the cutting edge of the modern global economy, and we have the capacity to be right up front, and we should be right up front. And, you know, I, d I don't know if this is an area you looked at. It, it is one that I looked at for my book, but, and for, for my, the work I did when I was in government. But uh, um, under Mbeki, we had a minister for 10 years under whom the, the, our metrics kept getting worse. After President Zuma took office, he changed minister, the, the communications minister every year for five years. Now, I know from being in government, and I'm sure you know from your experience, if you change a minister every year, 
it's a catastrophe. There's going to be no progress because it takes a minister a year to figure things out, to get the right staff, to learn, learn the ropes. But the worst of all is the last change that uh, President Zuma made was to split the, ministry, the, the communications portfolio into two, telecommunications and communications. Now, even my most loyal pro-ANC expert friends threw up their hands at that because information, the information is, economy is defined as the convergence of um, telecommunications, broadcasting, and IT. Yeah. And it's the convergence that makes it the information economy. And, of course, that's exactly what Zuma split. Yeah, no, I think we can say that we have really not managed the information revolution for this country as well as we should have. That is absolutely correct. Yeah, and, and, and again, I mean, uh, you said to me before we went on air, uh, we should have a laser focus on jobs. Jobs should be the most important thing we're doing. And I think there's huge potential for creating jobs through call centers and things like that uh, in the country. Yes, I do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's low-hanging fruit in a lot of other places too, but... but, but uh, uh, somehow the mindset in government doesn't seem to focus on what's, what's expert advice, what is the best solution we can get. Yeah. Well, um, um, parts of government are very good indeed and parts are very um, slow, let's put it that way. We're coming to, the, to, to run out of time quite soon. I want to ask you one more question because your background and your mother's background we're going to talk about a little bit. You were, were in, involved in, in the religious community, in church, in ethics. Um, and, and politics and the intersection of those two. In the 80s, we had Archbishop Tutu, we had Alan Bussack, we had so many people. Now we don't seem to. What do you think has happened to civil society? Where is the leadership, the vision? Because, I mean, clearly, we know that there's moral disintegration in our politics. Well, I'm happy to report that I really think things have been beginning to change. I mean, it, it, it's common cause, I think, that after 1994, the churches fell fast asleep yes. in terms of their public, uh, their public leadership, partly because they'd been fighting apart. It was quite clear what was wrong, and they knew what to say, and they had it all sorted out. After 1994, they really uh, got a bit lost. However, that's, that's changing very dramatically at the moment, and one of the key leaders in this is uh, Bishop Malusium Pumluana, who is now the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. And he, with others, Frank Chikani and so on, are, uh, Bishop Siwa, are re, shall one say, um, blowing breath into the Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, and we're beginning to see the churches coming together as the, as the South African Council to start um, looking very seriously politically. The South Africa we pray for looking particularly at poverty and inequality, within that looking particularly at education. Well, I'm glad to hear it. We are, are uh, out of time. I look forward to seeing the consequences of it because I think what's needed, somehow it has to be, obviously not the United Democratic Front of the 80s, but some version that involves churches and all the other elements of civil society. Well, you see, I think, I think what one can argue here is that for the last 20 years, we've been working very hard on changing South Africa top down. That's been important, the constitution, law, all that. But we've got to work very much harder on change from bottom up, how to empower people at the grassroots to be really changing the society. And the churches are part of the bottom up change. Francis Wilson, thanks very much. Before we go, we only have about 30 sec seconds left to talk about the book about your mother, which has yeah. just come out, The Fires Beneath the Life of Monica Wilson, South African anthropologist. I just wanted to throw in something before, before I let you, you comment. Um, what was interesting about your mother, one of the many things, she also intersected, she was close to people like Z.K. Matthews right. of the ANC of the Mandela generation. She was also close to people like uh, Fakile Bum of the mm. next generation. Um, she was really quite remarkably interesting. No, she was. And of course, this comes from that other side of South African history that nobody seems to notice. The places like Lovedale, Healtown and all that, the, the old mission schools, which uh, educated everybody in the ANC up until very recently. Uh, where Mandela was at Hilltown, Mbeki was at Lovedale, uh, Sobukwe was at Hilltown, and so on. And so Monica was at school herself at Lovedale, which was a non-racial school in those days. She was at school with Frida Bokwe, who then married Z.K. Matthews. And Frida was a friend, a lifelong friend of Monica's. 
I'm afraid we, 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 we have to wrap it up there. We could talk about this for hours. It's really fascinating. Um, read the book, The Fires Beneath. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I'm John Madison. Good night and happy reading. Thank you.